Hi, so in this part we're going to be discussing synthesis. Synthesis is the pro process of doing multiple reactions in a row, starting from very simple starting materials, doing sequential reactions until we obtain more and more complex molecules in the end. So synthetic organic chemists, those who do synthesis as their profession, like to look at molecules like this. So this is vancomycin. It's known as an antibiotic of last resort. So if you have a bacterial infection uh, that is resistant to a very common antibiotic, such as different types of penicillin, vancomycin might be used. And even some bacteria are now developing resistance to vancomycin. So there's even other antibiotics that are used if vancomycin doesn't work. So if you take a look at vancomycin, just take a look especially at just how complex it is. So here it is redrawn in another way. It's known as a glycopeptide antibiotic. Glyco refers to sugar. So notice that there are these six-membered rings here with oxygen in them, and these are known as sugars. Peptides refers to a chain of amino acids put together. So in this molecule, if you look over here on the right, so there is, starting over here, so there is one amino acid, and then it continues with another amino acid, and another one, oops, and another one, and another one. So these are amino acids all put together that together make a chain or make a peptide. Notice there are five aromatic amino acids, meaning amino acids that have benzyl rings off their chains. Two, are others, two others are aliphatic, meaning simply uh, sp3 hybridized groups. And notice all the stereogenic centers. There are also what's known as biaryl rings, aryl referring to benzene or related type of rings, something that we'll study in the latter part of the course. So A, B ring, two rings put together is a biaryl ring. C to oxygen to D is a biaryl ring. D to oxygen to E is another biaryl ring. Atrop isomerism is something you'd see in an upper year course. And look at all the stereogenic centers. All that to say that this is an incredibly complex molecule. So when nature synthesizes this molecule, and this is first isolated from a soil bacterium, the biosynthesis or natural synthesis takes 35 total reactional steps. Now different synthetic groups, and these are three very famous synthetic organic chemists, the Evans group took 40 synthetic steps, linear meaning that all the steps were done in a row, and 16 graduate students, so years and years of work to make this molecule. Casey Nikolaus' group did a synthesis of this molecule as well, using fewer, only 36 linear steps, and 18 graduate students. Dale Boger's group used 24, so the shortest synthesis to that point, and 11 graduate students on that particular synthesis. So an enormous amount of work to go into these syntheses. Now the way the synthesis works, all of them in very different ways, each one, they start with simpler molecules, they do one reaction after another, they get to a more complex molecule, more reactions, more complex, these three arrows mean that there are a number of other steps in the middle. Here are the more advanced intermediate, more complex molecule. Still more steps to become more and more complex until eventually we get vancomycin in the end. Now in this particular course, we will never do this many steps in a synthesis. Uh, we're going to stay in the two to three step range, maybe four or five at the very most. We're certainly not getting into four, 40 step syntheses. But this just gives you an idea of what it could look like. Now the way that chemists, including us, are able to plan a synthesis, we start from the target molecule and we do what's known as a retrosynthetic analysis. We plan a synthesis in reverse. So we start from the target and we disconnect different bonds, imagining what type of reaction could make that bond or ring. For example, we learn in a course that sodium borohydride can be used to make alcohols. So the H that I've just drawn in here might have come from sodium borohydride and it might have added to a ketone. This arrow that I've used is known as a retrosynthetic arrow, meaning that at the start of the arrow is the product, at the beginning of the arrow are the starting materials. So I'm going to leave off all those extra complex parts, but that OH in the product might have started as a ketone, and we might have used sodium borohydride to add that hydride to the base of the carbonyl, generating an O-minus, 
which would then have been protonated using, say, H3O+. And that's the kind of process that we would repeat for all the different parts of the molecule to figure out how to make it. The more reactions we know, the more options are available to us. So if you'll recall, we can do a Grignard reaction between a Grignard reagent and an aldehyde or a ketone, ketone in this case, to generate that first intermediate. So a Grignard reagent can add an R group to the base of a carbonyl, and eventually, after protonate, protonation, that generates an alcohol. So imagine we are doing this in reverse, and we are looking at this alcohol, and we are trying to figure out how to make it. One of the things we could identify, even if it hadn't been covered, co colored, is that the electrons between the, the carbon attached to the oxygen and this group over here on the top right, those could have been the nucleophilic electrons. So we might have started from a species that has a positive charge. and a species that has a negative charge, because remember that negative is attracted to positive. Now, we can't get simply charged molecules like this in a bottle, and certainly a molecule like this on the left would not be stable. But this can still give us an idea of how this reaction might work. And just to make sure we know, those electrons that I've just put in blue from that bond, those are these electrons here over on the right. So what these things are known as are synthons. They are imaginary molecules that let us know where the nucleophile and electrophile might have come from, although they're not the exact reagents that we would use. So once you have the synthons in mind, then you can start to think about what reagents might have been used. Now in this case, the closest that we have, well, we can think about a resonance structure here. So the real reagent that we could use could be the carbonyl. I've left off the proton, knowing that an acid-base reaction can easily transfer protons around. To generate a negative charge on the carbon, one of the things that I know best is a Grignard reagent, or you might have alternatively said an organolithium reagent. So we're going to apply that retrosynthetic analysis to try to make this molecule. So the first thing that I recommend as you're doing a retrosynthetic analysis is to draw out all the atoms and bonds around this place that might have a reaction. So in this case, it's around the OH. Now let's think about the different parts of the molecule. I know that I make, can make alcohols from Grignard reactions. I also know that I can make alcohols from reduction reactions, sodium borohydride. Those are the two types of reactions we've seen so far. Okay, so imagine then that I had made one of, those, one of these bonds, the OH and the H, from a reaction with sodium borohydride. The synthon might look like hydride. The other synthon might look like this. Remember, these are synthons, meaning imaginary representations of the reagents that give us an idea of where the nucleophile and electrophile might be. Okay. I can't use exactly this, but remember that that species that I've drawn at the top could actually be a carbonyl. So in the real electrophile, instead of having a full positive charge, what we actually have is a delta positive charge. And we know that can work as an electrophile. Now we have to think about what that nucleophilic component might be. First thing you might think of is just put a metal on it. So have something like sodium hydride. One thing I'll say, you haven't seen it yet, that does not work as a nucleophile. It is a base only. Sodium hydride is non-nucleophilic. So we have to think about the other reagent that we know. The reagent that we know that gives a nucleophilic hydride is sodium borohydride. So we went from disconnecting, we can use a squiggly line to represent that, this carbon-hydrogen bond. It's the red electrons that were nucleophilic, so our thin synthon has the hydride nucleophile with this electrophile. 
that would have actually come from, or the real reagents would have been the ketone and the sodium borohydride. Try to disconnect the other two bonds on your own. So another possibility would have been to disconnect this bond on the left. If we had done that, we would have ended up with this species, three carbon species, as the nucleophile. And in this cation as the electrophile. Again, these are synthons. The real reagents would have been the aldehyde. And in this case, when we need a carbon nucleophile, the real reagent can be a Grignard reagent. And if we had to go back even further and say, well, how would we make that Grignard reagent? Remember that it can be made by taking an alkyl halide and magnesium. So these are the actual reagents that we could use to accomplish the reaction. We would add acids or bases as necessary to get the protons on and off. So the last bond that we could disconnect around this carbon would be with that phenyl ring. I'll draw that retrosynthetic arrow that I should also have drawn over here. And here I recommend to draw out any acronym. So I'm going to draw out this benzene ring. It would be the nucleophile. There's its pair of electrons that are nucleophilic. I suggest you also count the bonds and atoms to make sure that you have the right number of them. So there are our two synthons. In terms of actual reagents, the electrophile would be an aldehyde. The nucleophile could be a Grignard reagent, or just to do something different, let's make it an organolithium reagent. So this is the process of retrosynthetic analysis. So for any alcohol that we see, we look around at the three bonds attached to the carbon, and we see if it, we can make any reasonable kinds of disconnections, or write any reasonable kinds of starting materials from that. So what you've seen in this part, synthesis is a series of reactions that creates a more complex molecule from simpler ones. Retrosynthetic analysis is the process of disconnecting a more complex molecule by imagining the reactions that would be used to form each bond or fragment in the target molecule. Remember that for retrosynthetic analysis, we draw a retrosynthetic arrow, so a double line before the arrow, indicating that the products are on the left and the starting materials, abbreviated SM, are on the right. A synthon is an imaginary building block that shows where the positive or delta positive or negative, delta negative would be located in the real starting material. The reagent is the actual substance that would be taken from the bottle and added to a reaction mixture. It must be neutral overall. 